Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, just so you guys know, I, I don't expect this to run the whole hour, so I might be able to get out of here early. And I know it's late, so it's not too heavy. We're not going to be learning like statistics here, just to show you some light concepts that hopefully you'll find useful. I'm Mark Sonnebaum. I'm a uh, performance engineer at Acquia. I'm not a statistician, and I'm not a data scientist. Um, I'm just somebody who deals with deals with data sets a lot, um, and the things I'm going to show you are generally pretty safe techniques uh, for looking and exploring data sets without getting into statistical methods that can be much more error prone and best left to experts. Was somebody did this as if they couldn't hear me? Is that the case? Okay, good. So just a quick example of why this stuff is important. Uh, is, has anyone ever heard of this data set before? Okay, great. So it's just four sets of XY pairs. Uh, and say we want to we want to look at uh, we want to know how similar these four sets are. So the first thing somebody might do is do some summary statistics on them. Each y and x axis for those four data sets have the exact same x has the exact same mean. Uh, the other, the y-axis has a very, very similar mean. Standard deviation is almost the same. Those two summary statistics would suggest that these four data sets are almost identical. But when you plot them, that's what they look like. So it's a really, really great example of how if you don't look at your data and you're just using summary statistics, you may not actually know what's going on. You may be asking the wrong questions. And so that brings up the, the, uh, or the topic of exploratory data analysis. Uh, it was coined by John Tukey, I think it was 1977. He wrote a book on this. Uh, his main idea was that at the time, data was being used to confirm hypotheses. Um, but there was an issue with confirmation bias because you basically start with your hypotheses and then use the data to see if it passes or fails. Uh, and his point was more that you need to explore the data set to figure out if you're even asking the right question. Um, because once you explore the data set, you might realize that there's questions, or there's interesting questions you can ask about the data that you wouldn't have known otherwise. And so, like, especially if, if you haven't dealt with any of this stuff before, I mean, I'm, pro I'm guessing almost everyone here has graphed some data in their life. Um, if you've used, like, something like GNU plot, or if you've used, like, D3 or any of the JavaScript libraries, uh, it's very likely that you were just treating it basically as a way like, to present the data. Um, but data visualization is much more than that. It should be part of your analysis process. So the first thing that I usually look at is I figure out just if the data set is correct. Uh, I've, I've seen results from people multiple times who didn't do this check uh, and just showed me the results and say this doesn't make sense. And then when I go look at it, it's like, oh, well, this data is garbage. Um, and so just having the data, like looking at the first couple rows, making sure, looking at the number of rows and make sure that it's like exactly what you expect is a huge, uh, huge help in finding, finding bugs. Uh, I've, I always do this and I end up, it's pretty rare that like the first time I write out the data set is I did it the right way. I usually find something, something wrong with it. And so the basic process is you formulate a question that you want to ask about the data. Make a very fast, like basic plot just to make sure that everything looks right. Uh, and then hopefully that will tell you something about the data just by looking at it, and then you start to refine your question. And then you just iterate through this process. And you also need to ask yourself, can the question be answered with that data? Um, sometimes it, it's unfortunate that you, you have the one data set, uh, and you may find that this is not the case. You can't actually answer it. But at that point, it's a good idea to stop. Um, to stop and either get more data um, and not report the results for like the limited data set you have. And because this is part of a iterative process, it needs to be very fast. Um, the, the process of say like getting a CSV and then like pumping it into D3 and getting D3 exactly the way you like it, that is not uh, fast enough to support like an exploratory uh, analysis workflow. So this quote, it's a really good one. Um, Hadley Wickham I'll introduce later, but uh, Basic idea is that the, the bottleneck in this process is cognitive. Um, and so we need, to, we need to 
optimize the process for, for that, not for, um, say, like the presentation layer. And that brings us to R. R is designed with this process in mind. Um, it's interactive. It, uh, well, actually, I'll go on to that in a second. Um, you might ask yourself why I would want to learn another language, because a lot of these things can be done in your existing programming language. The interactivity of it is a huge help. Uh, it also has some very robust two-dimensional data structures. Uh, it's very common in, like the two general languages for this are R and Python, but not actually Python. It's like Python with SciPy and all the other things. Um, and they have data tables, which I'll introduce later. Uh, it's basically like two-dimensional like matrix-like structures. It's like an in-memory structure of a CSV type of thing. And also there's like built-in graphics output. Almost, you can almost think of it as like a like a third stream outside of like standard error and standard out. And the community is amazing. The base R language is a little bit limited, but uh, we have what has been called like the Hadleyverse. It's like this guy, Hadley Wickham, he's a data scientist at, uh, I think at Rice University and works for RStudio. He's wrote tons of packages that make the language like infinitely better to use. And usually, for most tasks, I'm actually just using functions exported by his packages. And so it's a, and it's, it's vibrant too. Like it's, when I started four years ago, half the stuff wasn't out. And so it's constantly getting better. So just quickly to cover this, my favorite way to install this is just brew install or brew cask install. Um, I recently had somebody complain about how difficult it was to get compiled on brew, but don't try to compile it. Just install the package, they're good. And this is what you see out of the box. You get a console, and then you get this other window that's the plot viewer. That can be useful, but you're probably gonna get to the point quickly where you want to save what you have and work with actual files. And so as much as I'm not generally like an IDE guy, I can say RStudio, it's a free IDE, it is excellent. Uh, it's absolutely worth using. Um, you can, you just type your files in there like a normal editor, and it has a built-in, um, you can see this, here's where the code is, um, here's the console, uh, here's some different ways to explore the data, and then all your um, plots get pushed over here. So it's a very nice workflow, it works, works for me. I don't wanna go through and just like tour like the whole R language because there's a, there's a lot to show and it's kind of boring, but I'm just gonna like as we go, show you little bits so that you can understand the examples, um, but just some like very, very basics. The vector is like the most primitive type. Uh, it's, a, it's a vector if you know vectors from any other languages, but the main idea is it's multi-value and every value and it has to be the same type. So this example of like a vector of uh, numbers and a vector of strings. And data frame is the, is the structure that you're going to be using most of the time. Um, it's a, it's a two-dimensional uh, data structure like a matrix, but every column has to be of the same type and of equal length. So it essentially, you can like internally visualize it as like a CSV. And it's just a real simple example of how to make one and then what it ends up looking like. Um, most of the built-in uh, functions in R are vectorized, meaning, so if I have the floor function and I give it one number, it gives me one result. Uh, and also that, that C function, that's just how you create vectors. Um, if I give it essentially an array of numbers, it does that for each array. And so most of R assumes uh, one or many. Like actually, if you, if you make a, like a character, say like something equals the letter A, that's actually a vector of length one. It also has functions as values, which you'll probably recognize as, like from JavaScript. You define functions by just like creating a function and then assigning that. And you might, you might have noticed it has a weird assignment operator. Uh, I'm told that back in like Bell Labs, because um, it started uh, based on the S language that was in Bell Labs in 1976, I think, that was apparently one key, but they just kept it. And so reading data in, uh, you wanna get your data into a two-dimensional format. Uh, CSV or TSV works really well. I would avoid JSON. Um, because JSON is like infinitely nested uh, and the data structure, there's a, a bunch of different libraries for in R to read JSON, but you end up with like a pretty unwieldy object when you get done. Um, you always have to flatten it. I'll put these slides online, I don't expect you to actually like copy down that gist. 
Um, but I have a script that I use that flattens any JSON file. Um, it essentially just takes all the nested keys and concatenates them with dots. Um, and so I use that when I have JSON that I need to pull in. So here's just a quick example of how to do this. Uh, here's a CSV that I got just from Varnishstat, which obviously didn't come straight from Varnishstat. It doesn't like come out of CSV. And so one thing you can do when you're starting is don't focus too hard on making R read the data format you have. Write a script in whatever language you have to create a clean CSV file, and your life will be a lot easier. And so there's just like the super, super basic reading a CSV file and making a plot. This is using the base plotting system in R, and that's the last time I'll show that. It's not very interesting, um, and there are better options now. And just to quickly show it, it also has a, a pretty good package for reading logs. Like basically the log format is delimited by spaces and then also respects quotes. Um, and so I have a sample access log like this. I can use this uh, web reader package, just do read CLF, uh, standing for common log format, and then I get a data frame back, um, parses everything into the right uh, columns and then uh, assigns the right type to it. Just some quick terminology uh, before we go forward. In this world, uh, you'll hear, you'll hear uh, talk about variables in a data set. A variable is essentially a column. And rows are observations. And there's essentially two types of variables. Uh, one is continuous. You most likely, like, I think essentially the only two are numeric and date. Uh, so continuous means on an axis, it could go on forever, and there's no like discrete steps in between. Versus categorical or discrete, or discrete. I think D3 maybe calls it like ordinal or something. Um, that's just uh, individual strings, essentially. Um, and I'll, I'll show examples of that. But it's, it's good to recognize which one you have, because that will uh, affect how, what you're able to do with the data in terms of visualization. And so just some basic plots with those two ideas in mind, working with this data set here. Uh, this came from a monitoring system that just checks a website from different, uh, different locations. So say you just want to look at one continuous variable. A continuous variable uh, in this example would be like the time that it took uh, in milliseconds. The most basic, like simple visualization for that is just a histogram. Uh, it's one of the most useful uh, plots that you can make because it gives you a, a very clear vision of uh, what the distribution of data looks like. And then I also like to add that bottom piece, which is called a rug, um, which just shows, it also shows the distribution of data and then can be useful if your bins in the histogram are, are wide. But yeah, and you, you'll notice I, I added a bin width. By default, it just divides it into 30 bins. Um, but this is something you always want to play with because like, and so the bin is basically how wide the bar is. Uh, and so you'll, you can get different insights out of the data by messing with the bin width because it's very domain specific. So you have two continuous variables. Uh, so say in this case, we're dealing with uh, response time and dates. The simplest way to do that is just a line graph. Um, this may look a little boring, um, and I know like now, like. Uh, everyone uses stuff like Grafana, or not Grafana, or Book Fauna and the other one that it's based on. Um, what is it? Kibana. Kibana, yes. And so everyone immediately just wants like uh, what's called an area graph, where it's like it's dark, you have like the outline and everything under it's colored, but that conveys actually no more visual information. So I, I would I would encourage you to just like live with the boringness of these because that's it doesn't matter. <laughs> Um, the other way we do that is actually a simple scatter plot. And you'll see here I added alpha. Um, adding alpha to scatter plots is very useful because you can, you can get a better idea for the density. So you can see like up here it gets a little softer. So I can know that that's only actually a couple points, whereas like here it's essentially black, meaning there's tons of points there. And it's also an example like in R you can render to, I think it renders by PNG by default, but you can also render to SVG. This is a plot you don't want to render in SVG because you can end up with a million little SVG objects in your browser, and you don't want that. 
Say if you have one continuous and one categorical, that's when you end up with, uh, I don't know how to describe it other than, I think it's pretty obvious when you're looking at it. Uh, so you're saying, I'm saying the categorical variable is uh, the agent. And so it splits it up by agent. If, you, if I didn't add that, then it would just basically be one plot in the middle. And this is a box plot. I'll go into like what that is a little bit later. Um, and I also didn't introduce at all this plotting system. It's ggplot. Uh, this is like the one that I like to use. It's one of the most popular. And this AES function uh, stands for aesthetics. And so the idea there is that you're, you're doing aesthetic mappings. And so you're saying, I'm mapping the agent uh, to the x-axis, time to the y-axis, and then I'm mapping the color aesthetic to agent. And then so it knows how to essentially just make the plot once you've given it that like semantic information. So for two continuous, one categorical, you go back to essentially the line graph, but now you have a line per categorical variable that you told it to make. And this is actually very hard to read because it's all just on top of each other. And so another way, right, another way to do that, or if you also have two categorical variables and you want to split it up two different ways, you can use what's called a facet. And so you can say, do that same thing, but actually, yeah, my slide is wrong. This is not two categorical. It's still one categorical. It's just clearer um, because I'm using agent for the facet and then also for the color. But it's a nice way to just quickly break it out and get a graph per uh, item in the list. I use this one very, very often. And so I mean, there's a, sort of a joke in the data science community that you spend most of your time actually like getting your data in the right format to, uh, to work with. And I, it, it's very, very true. Um, I think this is one of the things that trips people up a lot um, because you will never get clean data sets. You will always have to do something with it before you can actually like start plotting or just start exploring it. Um, and before when I started, I would do most of this just like like in a Ruby script and just get it like pristine and import it, which if you're if you're new, that still works great. Um, but the, the tools to do some of these more common things uh, are now in R, like this tidier package, which is another uh, Hadley Wickham package. Uh, it's an example of the most, one of the most common things you have to do. So if you, like that initials of varnish uh, CSV we looked at before, you have time, client connections, client requests, cache hits. The value of all of those columns are essentially the same, actually with the exception of cache hit. Um, but it's a numeric value. And if you only ever wanted to say, say you wanted to graph time and client connections, you can do that pretty easily. But if you want something like the graph I showed before where there's a line per, um, per client connection request or cache hits, then you have to rethink what the data set looks like in terms of what is, a, what is a value and what is a variable. And in this case, you could argue that client connections and client requests are not actually variables, they're values. And so you can use this gather function to make wide data long. And so you turn that into a metric and value. And then whichever the value was is in the value column, and then that assigns to the right metric. This is like the most, it took me a while to figure this out when I first started in R, but it's like the most common thing you'll have to do is you'll have to always make wide data longer because everyone makes wide data um, because it's easier to think about it. It's like, look, looks that way in Excel. But then as soon as you do that, you can do a really simple aesthetic mapping. So you can map color to the metric. And now I have lines per uh, metric that I had. You can also end up, just another simple example, you can also end up with stuff like, like especially performance tools might, um, they might output their value with say like milliseconds attached to it. That sucks because I can't just like plug that in because it won't get parsed as numeric. Um, and that'll actually essentially end up as a categorical variable, not continuous, when milliseconds is obviously continuous. Then I can use like this extract function, give it a regex value, and then it splits that out for me. And then I also retain the milliseconds unit. Um, so if there's anything that, that's different, I can treat them differently based on that. And there are a bunch more verbs in that package, but there are things to look up when you have the problem. Uh, manipulation is another huge thing you'll have to do. The dplyr package is the, the best option there. It actually works with more than just the data frame type. It works with the databases as well. Um, it has a, a very SQL-like um, set of verbs, and so you can actually translate it to SQL and use it on a database. 
It is also, I'm going to take the time to inter inter introduce this pipe operator. Um, it's not unique to this package. It's supplied by another package, but it's used a lot. Um, it's used a lot in modern R, and especially the packages I'm going to show you. And I'll show you why. So say you have this line of code. Um, you're calling filter, and then you're calling select, and then you're calling head on that. That can get a little unwieldy. Um, so this pipe operator lets you chain them together. And so it's much, much easier in terms of how you think about the data flow. It's much easier to edit. You can just like comment out lines um, instead of like messing with the parens all over the place. And so all that means is take what's before me in the pipe and use that as the first argument in the next function. If you're familiar like if with like Lisp, I'm pretty sure Clojure has like an operator for that. It's a common thing in functional programming. So filter, the absolute most common thing you'll have to do. So that uh, data set I had before, uh, with the different requests coming from different places. I can easily say, okay, filter where agent equals this, and then also where the date time is within this range. And then just continue to pipe that to ggplot and plot it. There's also a really great way to narrow down the data set. Like I was recently looking at a set of log data for one day, and it was, I think it was like two million uh, hits, hit the log. And that was a very, like a, if I did the wrong thing in the plot, my machine would just sit there and hang. And so, <laughs> I first do a bunch of filtering uh, to make sure that all of my uh, visualization is right before I plug the entire data set in. Uh, group by and summarizing. And you'll notice uh, that R was, in, R was created in uh, University of Auckland, New Zealand. And so the language itself uses British spellings. Uh, it's not a typo. Yeah, you may have noticed before, I think color had a U. So group by, I mean, you're familiar with the concept from SQL. Um, but here's an example that I'm not plotting here, but I'm just doing a basic summary. And I'm saying that filter is uh, basically filter out requests that don't have a time, because some of them didn't have a time. Group by the agent, and then do a summary. And I'd say, and this median and quantile, these are just base R functions. And so I'm saying, do the median quantile for the 95th percentile, 99th percentile on this column, and then because I called group by before, it knows to do this only for the rows that, uh, that are in each group. And then the result is I have those four metrics for each uh, agent. Uh, mutate is the way to create new variables. And so it's an extremely simple example. Say I have um, the, the time was in, I think, seconds and I want to see in milliseconds, I can just say, okay, mutate total time in milliseconds equals the total time column times 1,000. And now I have that new column that I can plot. Uh, there's a bunch of examples of how you could use that, but it's a little boring. And so summary statistics, uh, this is something that I think everyone is pretty familiar with, um, but I think we all need to think about it a bit more because it, it gets misused a lot. Mean and standard deviation. Uh, mean is average. For those of you who don't know, uh, and standard de deviation. Like you may hear people talk about uh, having a, having an average, and then not having a standard deviation is uh, not a good idea because it gives you no idea of how distributed the data set is. But even having the standard deviation is dangerous. So here's a just a quick example of what um, what we're usually talking about when we're talking about these metrics. So there's a normal distribution, and each of these uh, columns is uh, a standard, standard deviation apart from the mean. And the, the general assumption when you're talking about standard deviation is, I think it's like the first, the first two standard deviations before and after are 66% of the data set. Uh, the two standard deviations, I think, is 95% of the data set. And then three, 99% of the data set should fit in there. And this example shows that that's the case in a normal distribution. Here's some latency data. Uh, this was recorded from a web service, and so it's response times. The red dot, or the red dotted line in the middle is, uh, is the average, and then those blue lines represent that many standard deviations away from the mean. And in this example, I think it's pretty clear that the numbers I talked about before about how many or what percent of the data fits within those standard deviations is just complete bullshit here. It does not work at all. Um, and so, the reason is this is a multimodal data set. This is not normally distributed. So normal distributed means bell curve. 
if you're dealing with response time data, response time data is never normal. It's often multimodal. Um, it's often, or not only um, not normal, it's often multimodal. This is an example of a multimodal uh, uh, data set. There's one giant mode here, but there's also a little mode here, which is why the, the mean is actually in the middle. And so if you just had that number, it doesn't really tell you a whole lot about the data set. So don't use these metrics unless you absolutely know for sure that the data you're working with is normally distributed. And I can assure you, if you're dealing with response time data, it will never, ever will be. So one uh, better option to use is called the five number summary. This is also uh, from John Tukey. It gives you the minimum and the maximum, the median, which is the 50th percentile, and the lo lower and upper quartile, which is the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile. It's also much easier to reason about because you can say, so for the 50th percentile, the median, 50% of this data set falls below that value. For the 75th, 75% of the data falls below that. And if I do, so the summary function in R actually gives me the five number summary plus the mean. And you can see, so the mean here is 25 and the median is 12. So you can see just sort of how worthless the, the mean is in that situation. But this is also what the box plot is. He's also the inventor of the box plot. Uh, in a box plot, the line in the middle of the box is the median. The bottom of the box is the 25th percentile. The top of the box is the 75th percentile. And the lines usually extend, there's different algorithms for how to do it, but the lines usually extend to whatever it considers, uh, I think it's actually like the 95th percentile, and then it still plots little dots for the outliers, so you can see like what the long tail looks like. I really, really like box plots for really any data set because it gives me a very quick way to see what's going on uh, and what the distribution looks like. Um, I can get it, I can do it with histogram, but I can't, uh, I can't, not facet a histogram, I can't uh, divide a histogram up by different categorical variables. Which I'll, I'll show in a second. So if you've ever used AB, which I'm sure lots of people here have used AB, here's a screenshot of, it, of its output. And it gives you a bunch of different numbers. The min, that's totally useful. The maximum, that's totally useful. It gives you mean and standard deviation. Don't ever look at these. These are, just ignore them. Pretend they're not there. The bottom part, where it shows you um, the percentiles, so it's showing you the 50th percentile, 66, all the way up to 100, that is the absolute, that is the only data you need. It is the most useful data. Uh, it's also much, much easier to reason about. You can say 99% of these requests were under 239 milliseconds. But 50% were under 35. These numbers do not give you a useful way to describe the data set. Uh, and it's really unfortunate. Most, most load testing tools will give you the average. Uh, hopefully among other things, but the, the treatment of this data is, is, is pretty lacking. Uh, in, in most tooling. So, and just to show another example of how to look at, like, other good ways to look at latency data. So I showed the box plot before, but a lot of times you want to see it going over time. You can also just divide it up into bins. And so I think for this one, I said, like, every 30 seconds, give me a box plot. And that's, it's telling me quite a bit. I can see that the distribution is, like, very, very tight, and then all of a sudden it goes way up. And so something there, something is happening there that I would have missed otherwise. Another way to view distribution data over time is a heat map. This one's a little hard to see, um, but and you'll actually you'll see like the SysDig is doing something with this now. Um, like DTrace had a bunch of heat map stuff. Um, it's nice because you can see that so there's the time going forward on the x-axis and the response time uh, on the y-axis, and it's sort of like a moving histogram. The intensity of the white here is how many data points fall within that range. And you can see there's also, like, so right now, we're on the very beginning, it's really tight, it's all just white there, but then all of a sudden, there's these, like, little tiny gray uh, splotches. And you can see, like, some, some requests were falling in that range, but not all of the requests. Still more requests were down here, which, again, shows that this data set is multimodal. And one of the reasons for that, for latency, is there's usually always a fast path and a slow path. Uh, if it's, like, a Java app, that slow path is almost always garbage collection. And so you'll see one, like a second mode, 
because every time garbage collection runs, it's however many seconds that was added to the response time. Um, for something like a Drupal site, it could be however, like whatever that interval is where you miss your cache. And so every uh, cache warm, that's another mode. And so in terms of the actual presentation side, like once you go through this process and then you get, you get a really good understanding of the data and you want to show someone, there's also some really great tools for that. R Markdown uh, is a very popular format, it's supported well in our studio. Here's an example of it. It looks essentially like um, GitHub flavored Markdown, but it doesn't just embed the code. Um, anytime that code outputs something, whether that's to the console or an image, it creates, uh, or like for the image, actually creates the image and then links that into the Markdown document. So this presentation is actually all written in our Markdown. All of the like plots you saw before, I didn't place any of that there by hand. I just put the R code in, rendered it, and then they all just show up. And so it's nice because I can just like write like a report, put the plots in. I can choose whether or not it's it's going to show my code in the plot. It's usually a good idea to keep the code in there in turn like if you're trying to create like re, re, reusable research or reproducible research, um, you want someone else to run that and get the same results. But if I'm giving it to like my manager, they don't want to see my code. And there's also like a one-click um, publish to a site called RPubs, which is maintained by the company RStudio. This makes it even nicer because I can just get it to where I want it, say publish to RPubs, and then just like give somebody a link to that and share it instantly. If you want to, you can go to rpub slash msonobomb and look at all of my stuff there. There's lots of like R examples of how to do things. And just to quickly show, like the, all the plotting before was ggplot, and one thing you might be thinking when you're looking at that is that it's all static, and we now live in a world where, I mean, we're web developers, we want everything to be dynamic, and we want to be able to interact with it. Um, that's valid. It's not that conducive to like the exploratory process, actually, being able to interact with it in the exploratory process can be important. But there's this new package called ggviz, which I think will essentially, will eventually replace ggplot, but it's not quite there yet. But just to show a quick example. Make that bigger. So this looks similar to the example before. I add a histogram layer, but then I can add an input slider. Instead of giving the bin width a value, I can say input slider. And so if I run this code, Right, so in the viewer here, that's actually interactive. And you can see what the histogram looks like when you change the bin width. Things change quite a bit. And this is all HTML and CSS. It essentially renders to a library that uses D3 on the front end. And I can pop that out and actually view it in my browser. Um, it is pretty mature. The only thing it doesn't have is faceting. That's the only reason I haven't switched to it. Yes, Daniel? Very, very good question. Um, so on the back end, it uses a project called Shiny, which is a R, R web server technology. So it spins up a web server in the background, um, and then it, it handles the interaction between the front end and the web server, which is very important, because if you're using, say I was working with the data set that I mentioned before, there was like a couple million lines. If you put that in the browser, your browser will crash. Um, there's no possible way to do that. Um, but if I do this, I can actually just have that in memory sitting on the R server and just make requests to it, and it'll still be very fast. And there's also, like similar to RPubs, there's like a shinyapps.io. Once I make that, I can just publish it there, and then people can interact with it. And so if you want to learn a bit more about this, um, there's a bunch of books on the subject. But I actually suggest two that very recently came out. Uh, Roger Pang works at um, John Hopkins University in Biostats, and he runs like the, the R Coursera courses, or the data science specialization. Um, and he put two books recently on uh, LeanPub, which is a site where you can just like, pick what you want to pay for it. And they're, they're small, they're really to the point, and they're, they're very easy to understand. They're, they're not written from a perspective of like knowing a bunch of statistics background. And so I'd suggest those are very good. And those are the packages. This will be online later if you want to look at the packages that I showed. And that's it. Uh, I would ask that uh, if you can find this session node and do an evaluation, that would be awesome. And uh, I'll take questions if anyone has any.
Yes, please use the mic if you ask a question. So, um, don't think the mic's on. Oh, there it is. Um, so, the uh, are there any resources that you could point us to for that basis in statistics? I was a lowly art major, <laughs> and I taught myself engineering, and there's a huge hole. Uh, oh, yeah, I was a music statistics. major. I, I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, so, yeah, so that's a, that's a big topic. None of the things I showed really requires much uh, statistics knowledge. Um, when you get into things like, I, I basically showed, I mean, R has an incredible support for modeling, uh, like forecasting, like doing linear regressions, that type of thing. Um, I didn't show any of that. Because those were the, I mean, some of those were simple, like doing a linear regression is sort of simple. Um, but that quickly gets into the realm of if you don't have like a pretty solid statistics background, you can come up with incorrect results and you won't know that they're incorrect. Um, and it's really best left to people who know that stuff well. Uh, I, I would say if you want to know it better, uh, the data science specialization on Coursera is very good, specifically the um, statistical inference course. It's also very hard. Um, I got halfway through and I had to take a break. Um, and, it, and it's also I found, for me, it wasn't, like it was interesting to know and I wanted to brush up on those skills, um, but it's not that useful for what I do. I'm not, say, like looking at like a popula pe or population of people and like find a, trying to find clusters and trends and doing like k-means clustering, that kind of thing. Like I'm not, um, I'm only dealing with like these relatively small data sets that I can look at and then make very simple inferences. They're not like such a large data set that I need to create a model for. Um, so it may not, it may be the case for you that you don't need to go that far. Um, but I would encourage you to explore it and see. Yes, go ahead. I have a follow-up if nobody else uh, does. Um, could you speak to your uh, data collection process? I know you talked a fair bit about the um, analyzing after the fact, but presuming you're not logging and sampling all of the metrics all of the time, I'm sort of wondering what tools you use for that collection initially, you know, yeah. to get it into the thing that you turn into the CSV, and then also um, is this sort of usually something that you do uh, mostly to diagnose a problem once you've actually observed something? And so are you going back to the snapshot of the outage where you already have to have that data in advance? Or so is it I'm, I'm not doing that. Um, it's really difficult to get the kind of, like, because the kind of data, I'm showing everything is raw data here. There's no aggregation. Um, it's very difficult to get that kind of data from production with zero aggregation. Um, it's hard to store. It's hard to get out of the machine in an efficient way. Um, so typically you're not going to have that. Uh, unless you're Netflix and you have one second resolution. Um, very uncommon though. Most of the data that I'm looking at are, I mean it would be great if like the server level tools did this stuff by default, like they would output a format that I can just easily ingest. Unfortunately, it's not the case. Um, this is usually me setting up an environment, trying to recreate a production event, or just say like just doing, uh, testing something that just needs to be benchmarked or whatever. Like I did this with a bunch of Drupal 8 stuff. Um, and then I, my favorite tool, for monitoring and getting good data out of is DSTAT. Um, DSTAT is a Python application that wraps a bunch of other tools. Like it, it'll read proc VM stat, it'll re it basically reads proc for all the things that you want. Um, and the output, you can combine essentially the output of like VM stat, uh, MP stat, IO stat, uh, N or net stat, all those things that are very useful but you can't ever see them all together. Um, you can run DSTAT with all the flags you want and then give it an output file, and the output file will be a CSV. It's a bit of a pain in the ass because like most tools that write CSV, they do something to fuck it up. Um, the header is not uh, like valid CSV, like it actually has, uh, there's, it does them in rows, so like the odd numbers are essentially one CSV and the even are another. Um, I have a function that fixes it. I have like a, a local R package, I'll probably publish it eventually. Um, that reads in DSTAT files. But usually I'm doing that. I'm like, before I would like run MPSAT or run uh, IOSTAT, get the most parsable output I could from it, write a script to uh, convert that to CSV and import it. But usually I'm doing that at one second resolution because I'm, like in, in production, you'll probably have something like a 10 second resolution because you don't want that like constantly running on the machine and taking up CPU cycles. Um, 
But the problem is there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of issues in production that you will miss. They happen like very short CPU bursts. You'll miss them every time if you're only sampling every 10 seconds. Um, so this process in general, I mean, like I find performance work is this way, but especially like this analysis process. Uh, as developers, we want to automate everything. You really, really need to resist automation um, because if you automate things, you don't let the data surprise you. It's really like antithetical to the whole exploratory data analysis process. Um, and I find people doing this all the time where like they automate this process and they get the number back and they're like, oh, like, here, here's the number. I trust it, but it looks really fishy. And then once you actually dig into the data, it's like, okay, this automation is making an assumption that is not appropriate for this particular data set. Um, so I do, I write a lot of throwaway code. Most of my R is like, I write that script. I don't even bother like putting it in source control because I'm never gonna use that again. Um, which is why R and those libraries I showed were so great because I don't, I don't build up a, a body of code that I need to save. It's like it takes me just as long to rewrite a lot of that stuff as it does for me to go find where I did it last. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, if nobody has another one, I, I have one yeah, last one and it. I promise I'm done. We can uh, talk all day. We've done it many times. <laughs> Uh, does Grafana have any um, part in this process? Or for anybody that doesn't know, it's a tool for building graphs, a lot of the time out of kind of more real-timey constant stuff like uh, Graphite or InfluxDB backends where you'd feed those metrics in all the time and then you can graph them. I'm kind of wondering if R is complementary to having that, if R would point you at the th things you might try to create samples for and automate, if it reveals automation that would be useful or if it's just sort of like, I mean, they're, as well. they're pretty complementary. Um, those tools, I mean, like, those tools, like all performance monitoring tools, just love the shit out of line graphs. Everything's a line graph, and everything's, um, the x-axis is always time. It's like, everyone wants to see the line going over time. Problem is, like, that, for a lot of data points, that actually doesn't give you the data that you need. Um, like, having heat maps, having histograms is, is much more useful uh, when the, I mean, I'm sure you've probably seen in Grafana, it's like, okay, this line is constantly going up and down. It's very difficult to recognize that that's actually like a multimodal data set in some cases, right? Um, I know like Brendan Gregg at Netflix is like really pushing like performance companies to, to have more of those types of visualizations that are like richer in tools. I mean, that will end up in hopefully tools like Grafana. But right now, like things like Grafana are very much tied to um, graphite backends. Uh, that are time series databases. And so I like to treat those as just two completely separate things. Um, I mean, the original Kibana is from Elasticsearch. In Elasticsearch, you can actually do a lot of these aggregations. So you could have really interesting visualizations come from it, but everyone loves line graphs, so it doesn't happen. Hey, thanks for the talk. That, that was really cool. Thank you. Um, so here's the question. Um, this is great to, for you to explore the data on your own and you know getting some insights about what you see, and perhaps give some feedback to your your people, your team. Uh, how about when you want to explore, um, sorry, to expose uh, this data to other people, so they might be looking for other aspects, or or they might be looking for a different aspects. I, I know that there is a sleuth of attempts in, in the Drupal community to um, create some uh, modules that would play with data, charts and graphs, graphs, D3, um, others. Um, what, what is your favorite, if you have done such a thing, uh, what is your favorite stack? Also, I know that there's a Deacon guy over there who has also a nice uh, visualization module, right? Um, so for, for things like that, um, really all you need is a CSV file at a URL, right? And so if I've ever done, I, I can't remember, but if I ever were to do that, I think I probably have, um, as long as that CSV file is public, and then say I, I'll do something in R Markdown, and read CSV can actually take a URL um, instead of a local file. And so it'll pull that data set down, do the analysis, I'll publish that and say, okay, you can see it's pulling from the URL, here's all the code I used to generate that, you could copy this code, fork it, and make your own analysis of it, or you could just read that data set indirectly and do, like, use whatever library or processes you want. Like, Python has, like, IPython notebooks, I think which is called Jupyter now, uh, which is not exactly like our markdown, but there are, like, lots and lots of overlap, and I, I hear really great things about that project. Um, but if you're doing, like, if you're doing data analysis, 
uh, on anything. I don't. I really don't want to use the word big because like big data is like like no one no one here has big data. Um, it's like terabytes. Um, even medium data, none of us even have that. Um, but if you have, because uh, R does everything in memory, so if you have data set that is maybe close to like your memory size and you might be hitting the limits, um, or it's just big enough to where it'll be very slow in another programming language, you really want to be using R or Python, something that uh, can bind to C and Fortran, uh, that does like matrix math in an efficient way. Uh, if, you're doing, if you're doing this and then, if you're getting this data and then doing the analysis in the browser and then pushing it out to D3, it's likely that like the data set is pretty trivial to begin with. Um, so a tool like this may, may be overkill. Um, I personally find using D3 like from scratch to be like incredibly painful um, and not conducive to a like uh, iterative process at all. But if you really like that, you can totally do it. Anything else? All right, thank you.